Hello everyone, this is another episode of Fun.net and this one is a little special. We are at a different time than usual and today we have uh, Scott Hunter with us. Hi yeah, Scott. Great to be here today. Yeah, welcome back. Yes. You've been on the show again. Been a while. Yeah, it, it, it has, yeah, absolutely. So today we are talking about the new stuff. Yes, we uh, finally shipped Visual Studio 2017. Finally, yeah. And, and for me, actually, the, I think the more important thing is we finally shipped all of .NET Core. Yes. Um, including the SDK. The, the SDK, the tooling, the tooling yes. all of that uh, yeah, for, the, yeah. for the first time ever. Uh, if you're out there, um, now is the time to come and start using .NET Core. Yes. Um, we shipped, uh, you know, we, we RTM .NET Core back in, in June of last year. Mm -hmm. um, it was just the runtimes that were, that were uh, uh, RTM in that time frame, and the tooling was something that was still kind of in flux because we knew we were making this move from Project JSON to CS Proj. Mm -hmm. Which was uh, explaining the preview label that we had to put everywhere. Yeah, but it, but it, but it, confused, it, it confused a lot of people yes. because uh, you went to download the SDK, mm -hmm. and the SDK said, like, preview 3 or preview 4 yeah. uh, with a huge number after it, um, and so it... it you know, we got lots of feedback that that was confusing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm happy now that if you go download the SDK, um, it's just 1.0. Um, that's what's actually shipped inside of Visual Studio. And then the one available for download is actually 101 because it actually has support for more Linux. What display. version of .NET Core is inside the SDK? So uh, another, another change that we had is, is some customers ran into issues where they might have a, a project that was a, a 1.1 project or a 1.0 project, mm -hmm. and they had the wrong SDK installed. Yep. And so we used to have on our SDK download page, we had uh, you know, links uh, to LTS and FTS. What we've done is we've simplified uh, Visual uh, the, the SDK now, so there's just one SDK. Yeah, so um, the and the SDK contains both 1.0.4, which is the latest version of 1.0, mm -hmm. and, it, and it contains... Uh, uh, LTS, sorry. It's LTS, LTS. long-term support. So that's the, for the customer that wants to stay on mm -hmm. the original uh, .NET Core for a longer period of time, that's available. Mm -hmm. um, and it also contains uh, .NET Core 1.1.1, which, which is the is latest current. version of our faster track, which mm -hmm. is uh, mm -hmm. uh, 1.1 we released uh, in November. So if you want the tooling, if you want the SDK, you don't have to uh, think too hard about which version to download. There is only one. And it will contain all the runtimes that you will need and, and be able to target. Exactly. So yes. simplified download experience, go to the page, just download the .NET SDK for whatever platform you're on, and you get all of the .NET cores, mm -hmm. and you get the latest round of the tooling, which is the CS project right. tooling. And if you need only the runtime, let's say you're setting up uh, continuous integration or production server, then you need to... Then there's advanced the downloads for those, yes. but I think for the majority of people, the 99% case, you're just going to go and grab the SDK, and you're yeah. going to be good. Yeah. And as you said, if you're setting up a server, uh, there's a hosted bundle uh, for uh, setting up all the right stuff on a, on a server. If you actually mm -hmm. want to host ASP.NET Core on IS, uh, that bundle contains all the right stuff for that. Um, and then there's the raw runtime bundles that just contain the framework by itself as mm -hmm. well. So the links are, are really easy, easy to find, but we will still put them in the description so yes. people can find them. They're, they're, they're better. Um, we, yeah. we got some feedback yesterday that the download page was confusing a little bit because it didn't tell you that you were getting 1.0 and 1.1. Yes. Um, and I know that we're going to go try to fix that today. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, what about Visual Studio? What, what do you get when you uh, install Visual Studio 2017? So to me, I, when I think of Visual Studio 2017, I think of a couple things. One is you know, we have a new installer, mm -hmm. um, which code name internally we call it Willow. Mm -hmm. um, but the new installer actually is a lot more granular than it was in the past. And so the idea is um, just install what you want. Um, yeah, and the default uh, experience that it gives you is an experience from workloads, which yes. means uh, what kind of stuff are you going to do. But you also have, for people who are you know, very detailed oriented, you can click like the, I am. You, you can click the other tab. Yes, there and, is another tab. And then if you click the other tab, it basically shows you a list of all the individual yeah. components that are actually part of and the... And that's closer to the previous experience that we, that we had. Right? It, it, it's, closer, of, it's, it's closer, but the, other, the previous experience you really couldn't uninstall a lot of, I mean, you, you really, there was a whole bunch of stuff that was implied that was installed all the time. Yeah, you, um, you, you would check something and a whole lot of other things would be. You, you might check that you want to do C-sharp development uh, uh, for, for web. Yes. And yes. you can also build desktop applications and a, and a bunch of other stuff. So, so now, it's more predictable. It, it's, yeah. So now you could go and say, I want web, mm. and you won't get desktop. So, and as you said, some of those workloads, um, you know, for .NET customers, uh, there's a couple workloads that I think are important. One is there's the general desktop workload for building desktop applications. There's a web workload for mm -hmm. building uh, .NET web-based applications. There's an Azure workload 
uh, for building you know, applications that want to take advantage of Azure. Mm -hmm. And there's a final workload, which is our cross-platform workload. Uh, so there's, there's four or five .NET workloads in there that are the, the primary ones that I think of. Right. And the cross-platform one seems a little wider in, in terms of workloads. It actually doesn't look exactly like a workload. Yeah, it doesn't. It, it's, it's actually a smaller subset. It's, for, it, right. it, it's really, the, the idea there was, I want to build class libraries or console applications yeah. uh, that run across a variety of platforms. Mm. Um, and it's kind of a, it's, a, it's the smallest of any of the workloads in a lot of ways. It does contain the, the Docker bits as well. Right. Um, so you are able to okay. build a cross-platform console app or whatever, and you would, you would still get the Docker tooling. So if you want to go push that into a container. Okay. All right. So if you want to do .NET Core, to re recapitulate, if, if you want to do .NET Core with Visual Studio 2017, what's a good workload to pick? Um, web, Azure are great workloads to pick because that's where ASP.NET Core mm. lives, mm. Um, which is one of the pr primary uh, workloads for .NET Core today would be building web applications. Uh, it's also available in the cross-platform workload mm -hmm. as we were just talking about. Um, and you also get some of it is in, the, in the desktop workload as well because we want you to be able to build, mm. um, I wouldn't call it a .NET Core workload, but we, we want you to build this, this notion of .NET standards coming, or coming out. Yeah. Um, and we want to make sure that in any of the .NET workloads, you have the ability to at least build a .NET standard class library. Mm -hmm. Um, which can then be shared across all your, your projects. Yeah, let's talk about that. Sure. Uh, because lots of people are actually building libraries, uh, and there are several um, scenarios for that. You might want to build a library that is going to be used in one specific application, or you are going to build a library that you're going to share that's going to be an open source project or whatever that people are going to reuse. Uh, there are several .NET library project types there's the, too many, the, actually. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> we we could uh, we we decided not to try to tackle that and try to solve that yeah, in this particular yeah, version yeah. of Visual Studio, but we uh, had we had lots of discussions because mm -hmm. if you actually search for class library in the file new dialog box, mm. you'll get a, a long yes. laundry list of class libraries all the way from Silverlights to Windows. Yeah. Um, but but in, in the long run, I think the way we think of the .NET platform is, um, if you go, in, an interesting exercise for a customer would be go download JSON.NET. Yeah. Uh, the NuGet package. Uh -huh. And, and rename it to a zip file and open it up and look inside yeah. of it. If you do that today, you're going to find a bunch of what we call platform mm -hmm. folders. And so basically what it means is James Newton King uh, builds uh, JSON.NET many, many times uh, for a variety of the platforms. Yeah, and if you look at his source code, actually, you can also see you can, that you can see he has a lot of CS Proj in there, and hopefully uh, he would be able to simplify that considerably with .NET Standard. Right. Yeah. Um, and so the, the idea behind .NET Standard is in the future, if you cracked open the JSON.NET um, NuGet package, there would mainly be the net standard 1x or the net standard 2x folder, mm. um, and that version of JSON.NET inside of that mm. runs on all the net standard compatible frameworks. And so the way people should think of net standard is net standard is a contract. Mm. Um, imagine it says, hey, if you're a .NET and you want to be net standard compatible, you have to have all of these APIs inside of your implementation. Um, and then uh, Xamarin, .NET Core, .NET Framework, uh, and, and even some of the Mono stuff, they, they are all going to be net standard compatible, mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll support a certain version of net standard. Um, and you know, it should simplify your life, because you don't have to go build, if you're, if you're a JSON.NET guy, you don't have to go build uh, that, that framework uh, 15 times to support .NET. The idea would well, be if he still wants to support the Older there'll, there'll be some there'll, there'll be some the there'll be some older ones that he might yeah. want to support, but it, but it will mean he'll get to kill a lot of the folders. Mm. Um, and and in over that. time, it will it will only get better, and you'll right. be able to. Uh, o over to time, I it. think that uh, you know some of the older platforms are just kind of mm. going away in a lot of ways. I mean, yeah, and uh, so James has a very very widely used library, so he wants to have the maximum reach. But he does. That's not necessarily the case for everyone. And, uh, it, it's not. But even even with maximum reach, I think you'll be able to mm. see him kill a bunch of folders yeah, um, in his project when, when net standard. But what I'm saying is that for most projects, uh, actually targeting the latest uh, available platforms is, is a reasonable uh, trade-off, and you can do that with just one project right. and even just one target in your project. For, for most customers, if you're a customer yeah. and you're building stuff for your company, yeah. um, net standard two is going to, net, net standard is going to make a lot, a lot of sense for you because, mm. hey, you, you build a library one time, and it runs on iOS, it runs on Android, it runs on Windows, it runs on Mac. 
It runs on Linux. Hmm. Um, and that's what most people really care about is, is uh, being able to write something and run it on all those platforms. And um, in the past, we had other options. We, we had portable class libraries. Uh, that was the inverse of what .NET Standard is, which is you click more frameworks, and as you do, the API surface shrinks. Uh, .NET Standard is about, as I said, it's a contract that the frameworks have to implement. Um, and so uh, in this model, you get a lot of APIs all the time. Mm. You don't lose APIs as you click more frameworks in. And the is, contract is getting bigger. And the contract's uh, getting bigger. That's, that's the big thing is .NET Standard. We actually shipped the first version of .NET Standard back in June when, when we first shipped uh, .NET Core. Um, for we should also be very clear, .NET Standard is not a .NET Core thing at all. It, it lives outside of .NET Core. Yeah, that's why it We ship them together, name. and so a lot of people make them think, think that they're the same thing. But it, they're it started at the same time. Yes. Uh, it, it started in large part because of .NET Core, but it, it's... Uh, yeah, it's it, was a, it was a vision that happened in, yes. the, in, the, in the build time frame last year, mm -hmm. which is um, the .NET team, we were all looking and trying to figure out a way that we built lots of .NETs over the last 15 years. And how do we standardize those so they actually match, you know, they were all different. And so that we don't have a fragmented ecosystem. Exactly. I don't want to have fragmented ecosystems, yeah. so that's what Net Standard's about. And we don't want to have a fragmented tooling ecosystem either. And that's why we took .NET Core and moved it back to CS Proj. Mm. So today, if you look at Nugget, not everything is Net Standard compatible. So the ecosystem is a little fragmented. Yes. It's fragmented in two for the moment, but the long-term vision is that well, everything's well, going to be net standard. And even some of the uh, non-net standard libraries uh, are going to be usable at some point. Uh, right, right. If, 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 if there's an existing library out there today that's not marked as net standard, mm -hmm. um, if the APIs it uses match right. net st a net standard implementation, it will run there. So, so when we, we, we plan to ship net standard 2 later this year. Yes. Uh, when we first shipped .NET Core, um, we didn't have a lot of APIs. Um, it was a, a pretty big subset of the .NET framework. And as you said, as we start trying to defragment things, uh, we want to make it very easy for co code to be portable from Xamarin to .NET Framework, .NET Framework to .NET Core. And so we kind of took the intersection of Xamarin and .NET Framework, that set of APIs, mm -hmm. and that's what .NET Standard 2 will be. Um, and then .NET Core will support that as well later this year. And that means if you're a .NET Core customer, you're going to get a ton of APIs back. Um, if you're a UWP customer, sometime in the future, you'll get a bunch of APIs back, um, and we'll have API parity across UWP, .NET Core, Xamarin, .NET Framework, mm. um, which will be pretty cool. As a customer, you can just guarantee, there'll be a guaranteed contract that a yeah. pile of these APIs exist everywhere. Yeah, and I, I find it really interesting that uh, we're having this approach where there is a contract, but it's not anymore that library authors have necessarily to, to say, I do abide to the contract. If they do, yeah. if they already do, it, 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 it will, just it'll, it'll, it'll just work. So that's, yeah. you know, that's one of the demos that we'll do. Um, you know, Build conference will be in May, mm. and I know we're going to show some of this stuff in May, um, and that'll be one of the things we'll show is we'll probably go Very grab a, a class library from, that we downloaded off the internet that was built in 2002 or 2003, and we'll run it on .NET Core, and we'll just show that hey, guess what? You don't have to recompile any of that code. Um, if it uses the APIs that are in the standard, um, it'll work on any of the implementations that support the standard. And, and we probably need tools to actually go and identify, you know, if a library is actually compatible. Yeah, because I think we, I think it's, have it's not a guarantee that everything will run. It's, uh, it's just relaxing some, uh, some limitations, right? Yeah. But, yeah, if your library does some P invokes or has, you know, yeah. calls into other... If you, if you call into the operating system, we can't yeah. guarantee that yeah. you're going to run somewhere. So right. exactly. Um, okay. Uh, do you want to demo some stuff? Yeah, let's, let's, um, I need, before you, don't switch, to my, don't switch to my machine yet. Yep. I noticed that Docker was not happy. Oh. I can, I can fix that. So while, while I'm working on my machine, um, we can talk about a few other things too is, um, a bunch of other value was added with Visual Studio 2017. So if you're a, a customer, a .NET customer, I think uh, we talked about the installer. That was one thing. Um, another thing that I think is interesting is we added live unit testing. Yes. Um, and I think that's a pretty cool feature as well. So the, the idea behind live unit testing is today, uh, typically a customer runs um, their unit tests at some point, and the idea behind li live unit testing is as you're actually writing your code, your unit tests are running in the background all the time, 
And so you can actually see in real time um, as things happen, um, not having to wait until you actually mm. implicitly run that as a, as a, as a step at some point. Um, yeah, and it shows uh, coverage to an extent. It shows uh, coverage. As, as you're coding. Uh, uh, it's something that you need to activate, right? It's it not, is. It's not on by default. It's not on by default. You have to turn it on. Mm -hmm. uh, we run it out of process. Um, so the idea is it doesn't put memory pressure on Visual Studio itself. Mm -hmm. Um, so you don't have to worry about it sucking a bunch of memory up. It'll it'll run in a different process outside of Visual Studio. And it does all that incrementally. It right? does. Yeah. And so it does it does all the stuff incrementally. But it's it's a really cool feature. Mm. Um, another another cool thing that we've done in the product is um, Casey on our team has spent a lot of time, you know, improving the editors. Yeah. Um, so we've done a lot of work to make the editor in VS better. Uh, in a lot of cases, um, you know, a lot of things that ReSharper does mm. um, that are now in Visual Studio. Mm. Um, we even have a, a cheat, cheat sheet you can actually download uh, that shows you uh, the keystrokes um, for ReSharper and that shows you the corresponding keystrokes that we have in Visual Studio. A lot of, a lot of folks don't even know that yeah. we've had a lot of ReSharper features in VS for a while. Mm. Um, you just don't know what the keystrokes is yes. for them, and so you, know, you, you wouldn't find them. So that's good now. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an area that we, we have had a lot of improvement in um, that I'm really happy about. Um, and we'll show some of this other stuff here. So let me switch to my machine, and let's demo a couple of things. So this is VS 2017, and I'll do File New here. And first off, if you're a, a .NET customer, uh, this is the first version of Visual Studio that has .NET Core built in. And so you can see right here that I've got uh, a .NET Core node. And inside of that .NET Core node, I've got uh, console apps, class libraries, unit tests. I've got ASP.NET Core here. Um, oh yeah, I wanted to ask the live unit testing. Uh, it it doesn't depend on which particular uh, live unit testing test framework you want to use, right? It, it can work with XUnit and yeah. But, but, but let me also give a caveat of live, live unit testing. Live unit testing is for .NET framework applications today. It doesn't work with .NET Core yet. Uh, .NET Core support is coming in the future. Right. Um, also, you're going to notice here, I've got net standard. Um, that kind of goes to that conversation we were just having a, a, a bit ago. Uh, there's now a, a node here for net standard, so you can actually build a net standard class library mm -hmm. uh, that you can share across all your projects. Uh, but let's focus on .NET Core for a second here, um, and I can show you a couple cool things. So first off, uh, let's just build a console application. So for customers out there that tried .NET Core, um, before we actually had RTM'd all the tooling, uh, we used to have this uh, project file called project.json. Um, and it was a, uh, a file that the web team put together uh, years ago mm -hmm. as we were re-envisioning how um, web applications would be built. And as we standardized the tooling around CSProj, and, and for, for customers out there, you might ask, hey, I love project.json, why, why did you move uh, to CSProj? We moved to CSProj for the same reason we're doing .NET Standard. We want to unify everything. It would be, it's really weird when only .NET Core applications are project JSON based, but .NET yep. Framework applications and Xamarin applications are all using CSProj, and then you have to interrupt, and you want to have a, a Xamarin project use a .NET Core class library, and you have that, that, that CSProj to XProj conversion going on. So that, that we, had, we had challenges trying to make that work really well. Yeah, um, uh, and, and you're talking in a, in a case where you do the project to project reference. Project to project references. That, a package wouldn't be a problem mm -hmm. anyway, but. That's uh, where, that's where yeah. things actually started getting bad, yes. was, was, was we, we didn't think we could solve all the project to project problems, and so we moved to CSProj. But as part of that move to CSProj, um, we didn't lose anything. So our, our, I don't think we lost a lot. W w one of the goals was hey, we're all one unified team, so let's go take the cool features of Project JSON and put them into CSProj. Yep. So, uh, one thing customers will see is I can now right click on my project and I can, there's an edit CS proj that shows right up on the menu here. And here's my project file. Um, <clears throat> you'll notice that when you look at this project file, there's no GUIDs inside of this thing. Um, also, you're going to notice it doesn't list the files in my project either. There's, it's just uh, um, a simple, I want an, an exe, I'm targeting .NET Core 1.1. Um, and yeah, it's not just that the file is smaller because you don't have all those file references. It's that uh, next time you need to merge. Yeah, to me, <laughs> and that's, there are, and to the, to the, me that's the craziest yes, thing. Is it, all these years you've had when you merge, yes, merge, yeah. you had to go modify the CS project files as files are added. Yeah, and for me that's the number one advantage of all of that. And there are lots of 
crazy good things in there, but that one, y not having to merge so, so often on your project, that is so good. So, and just to prove that we, you know, you, know, you don't see the files there, so I'm in the folder of my project here, yeah. and I can just do notepad test.cs. Yeah, let's create let's that. that. Let's just save it. And there it is. It's already there. And notice in my in my in, in my VS, it just showed up. Yeah. Um, and the project hasn't changed. The project, there's nothing changed in the project. It just shows yeah. up. So um, you can just drag files in. Actually, I could even do this. So let's just go back to the console, and we can delete test.cs. Yep. And it, dis gone. and it disappears from Visual Studio. So that's yeah. That I think is pretty cool. That's a that's a that's a project JSON feature that we brought into here. Mm -hmm. So you, let's you still have the control. You can still uh, add some or, or exclude uh, files and folders from the exactly. CS project. Exactly. All those all those features are still there. Let's let's go and, and manage NuGet packages, and um, let's go browse and we'll just install uh, JSON.NET. Accept the terms. <coughs> so there we go. The package is there. Um, now there's this new node in VS as well called dependencies. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a, something we had in the project JSON and the project JSON based project system as well. And you can see there's my NuGet references. There's my uh, Newton Soft. Here's my SDK reference to the version of .NET Core that I'm using. Yep. Um, all built in. Um, so that's kind of a new node. That's kind of cool how we visualize that. Um, let's go back yeah, in. If, if your package has dependencies, you're going to be able to drill into that. And, yes. And you can see, you can see your packages like live in the yes. tree versus yeah. having to yeah. actually go to the package manager and see which, which things you have. Yeah, it's not going to be a flat list of all the, the, of, of the whole closure, right? right. It's, it's going to be organized. Um, let's, let's go back in and, and edit the CS project again. And you're going to notice that I don't, I don't have a project JSON. I don't have a packages.config. Uh, my references to the package shows up live in my CS project. Um, <clears throat> and what's cool is um, I want to I want to point out an extension. One of the things that people loved about Project JSON was mm -hmm. you could actually edit your package references live yeah. in the editor, and we gave you IntelliSense. Um, we don't have IntelliSense built in uh, to the CS Proj file today. It's coming. Um, I've got um, open up here. If you go to the uh, Visual Studio Marketplace and search for Project File Tools, this is a extension you can install. Yeah, uh, as usual, all the extension is made by Mads. It's not supposed to say Mads, actually. <laughs> that's actually an error. Okay. Um, it, it, was, it, it was built by uh, Mike Laborski. Oh, okay. Um, because on the, on the web tooling team. Um, but the only way when we, we were trying to publish it yesterday, we went to publish it oh, say Microsoft. Okay. And um, Mads already had an account, so it's under, under yeah. his name today, but we'll switch it to Microsoft. But um, you can come here, download this extension, and once you do, you'll get package intelligence here, just like you had in Project JSON files. So I really recommend getting that. Let's let's show some cool stuff here. Let's try this. Let's let's just delete this, and uh, let's show my dependencies over here. You, you didn't save. So I know on okay. purpose. Oh, sorry. I want I want to show sorry, sorry, sorry. Newton Soft is over there. If I save that, stuff will happen, and you notice that Newton Soft just disappeared. Yep. So um, same Project JSON kind of features you had before. You can you know modify this stuff, save it. Yeah, Notice because I had the extension, because I have the extension, I get to pop up over. Oh yeah, over, that is nice. Over this, um, and if I copy this, VS, and let's remove some of this stuff. Gonna work for me. I'm trying to see if it was gonna give me my IntelliSense. Oh, ah, there, there it goes. goes. Yeah, there you go. Um, so you install the extension, and you're gonna get the same type of IntelliSense as you type, um, showing the Microsoft namespaces, showing the description Even of the package. Even the description of the package. Yeah, that, that's all live awesome. in the tool. Um, so today, if you want that feature. Uh, Go to marketplace.visualstudio.com, search for project file tools, um, and you can get that back. And in, in a later update to Visual Studio, you'll see that that come back in as a uh, first class feature as well. Mm -hmm. We just we just couldn't get it to RTM quality. Um, you saw even as I was typing, it kind of glitched a few times. But uh, so that's kind of the CS Proj stuff that, that we have. That's, that's pretty cool. So let me start over again. 
And let's show another feature. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to create an ASP.NET Core project. Uh, another feature that's new in this version of Visual Studio is for the first time ever, you can now target the different .NET cores. Yes! Right from the File New Dialog box, if you're building a console application, a class library, a, a web application, uh, you got this new drop-down. So you can select between the two .NET cores that we have. Um, <clears throat> and I want to point out this, there's this new Enable Docker Support checkbox down here. So when you, when you create a new project, you have the option of making it a containerized application. Uh, you can check this now, or you can actually add it later. So let's, let's actually add it later. So we'll create our web project here. So I've got a brand new ASP.NET Core project, um, all the cool tooling built in um, that you're storing. And um, as I was showing before, I could have at File New, I could have said, hey, I want to make this a containerized application. Um, but you can also add that to any existing core applications as well. So I can come right here. I can right click, I can go to add, and I've got this new option here, Docker support. And I'm showing this Docker support in the context of an ASP.NET Core project right now, but I wanna, wanna let customers know that you can, we, we support both Windows containers and Linux containers. If you're building a .NET framework application, um, that same right click, um, add Docker support exists there as well. And so I can, I can build a MVC5 application, ASP.NET System Web MVC5 application, right-click on it, enable Docker support, and I can publish that to a Windows container. We, we, we started supporting Windows mm -hmm. containers with um, Windows Server 2016. Um, in this case, I've got a .NET Core project, um, and I can also right-click, as I said, and turn it into a Dockerized application as well. And so you'll see I've got a Docker file here, and my Docker file is gonna contain a reference to the, the Docker image on Docker Hub that contains um, ASP.NET Core. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got some compose files here uh, for building my um, image. So what's cool here is by right-clicking and adding this Docker support, now I have the option uh, to run this in a container. So you'll see up here uh, where this normally would be IS Express. Uh, now it, the drop-down shows Docker. I can also decide what if I don't want to run this in a container. Um, the Docker option only shows up when my Docker Compose project is selected as my default project. If I come over here and make this my startup project, it switches right back to IS Express. So I have the option of running, running my application mm -hmm. normally like I always have in the past, or I can decide I want to run it inside the container by making this my default project. So it changes back to Docker. Nice. Um, so what's cool here is this, the, the benefit of a customer will get with Docker, uh, be it Windows or be it with Linux, is Basically, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm developing, I can, I can now decide to run inside of my container. That container would be the same image I would be running in production. And so for the first time ever, you can actually develop in your production environment. So let's, let's click this for the first time. I'll just say debug, uh, start without debugging. When I do this, down here, you're gonna see a bunch of stuff scroll through. Um, what's going on, the first time you do this, it's gonna take a minute or so, because um, what we're gonna do under the covers is we're gonna go out and build uh, a Docker image. We download that image from the, the, yeah. the internet. Um, we will then set that image up. We will copy your project into that image. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll start the container up um, and my browser will launch in a second and I'll be running in a container. Boom. So here's my app running. Now I'm actually running in a container. I can actually, if I go to command line and I say Docker images, there is web application two right there. And you can see it's a 287 meg image. Um, so I'm actually running my app in a VM. Um, it's kind of cool. Now, the nice thing is once the app is running, I can go back to VS and we could go make a change. I'm actually gonna actually make it change anything on the screen or anything, but I could just let's go add some, add some code. Save, I go back and refresh, and you get that, you'll get that same experience you've always had where I don't have to recompile, I don't have to republish, I can just go and, and make a change and refresh my browser. Um, we can go even further. Um, I could actually come over here, put a breakpoint in my application, and I can say start the container, 
In this case, we'll actually, uh, we put the remote debugger in those, in those Docker images for you automatically, um, and we do all the wire up here. Um, so I'm actually attaching my re remote debugger into that Docker image, that Docker container, um, and running it right from VS and breakpointing into that Linux image Yay. on my machine. So the goal here is to make uh, the Docker support first class. You, you should be able to feel like you can be comfortable and use Docker uh, without having to do a lot of work. Um, and it gets, it's even better than that. So that's, that's like, hey, I built an app, I'm running, running it in a container um, on my machine, I'm developing inside the live image the same way I would, you know, this image, image I'm gonna run in my production. Uh, we also made it very easy to publish these things. So I can come back over here, uh, I right click and said publish, and you're gonna see here, I've got this new Azure App Service Linux preview. Azure App Service is one of our Azure services um, that people publish their web apps to today. Uh, you have the option of publishing an app normally, or now, uh, with this preview, you can actually publish it into a container. So I can take my same container image and publish it up to App Service. Um, so this will fill in here. This is showing I've got my subscription. Um, so let's do this, CSH group. And we'll say, I want a new plan here. CSH plan, West Coast, standard image. And this is something new here. Um, let's see, CSH registry. Um, this is a container registry. So when you build containerized applications, uh, typically where you would actually publish one of those mm -hmm. things is to a container registry. Mm -hmm. uh, a popular container registry today is Docker Hub. That's where right. I actually got my base image for my project. Mm -hmm. uh, but we actually created an Azure service uh, that, that you can actually now publish your apps to. So when I, when I go through this step, um, we're going to create a Azure app service for Linux. We're going to create a Azure uh, registry uh, for my for my app and uh, creating uh, create here. This will start going out and creating those resources in the cloud. And then what will actually happen next is we'll actually publish my image to that registry. And then we've then we that uh, that Azure app service for Linux that we've created has a link saying, "Hey, you should be pulling this registry." And so as I publish my app to the registry. Then app service will actually wake up and notice, hey, there's a new there's a new image in that registry. I need to pull that image. It will pull the image over, um, and then your app's ready to go. Excellent. And so the cool thing here is this will take a minute or so because I'm going to go create. You know, I said I'm going to create a service plan, a resource group, um, the app service for Linux, and the registry. It's going to create those things. Uh, you can see it's on five of five. It's now on 7 of 7, so notice it's a, it's a fun glitch in, in the tool. It's, <laughs> now we're on 8 of 8, so it, it's... It's venting new steps. It's making new steps as it goes. Um, once this is done, this, this is one of the... There, 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 there you go, go. it's done. Um, and it should, there it goes. Now, now that it's created all those assets in the cloud, it's going to do a build, uh -huh. again, on my local machine. Build's going to happen here. And as soon as the build's done, it will actually start the process of publishing. Um, there it goes. So now what, it's act, what we're technically doing, you'll notice um, it, so it shows it's running Docker Exe, because yep. it's actually running the Docker SDK uh, to publish the application. And you're gonna see it push the image up. Um, and then after the image pushes up, uh, my app will be running live in the cloud. So uh, the idea here is we're trying to make this, this, this step of building and publishing uh, Dockerized applications as simple as possible. Yeah, it is pretty simple. That's pretty amazing. Isn't that pretty cool? Yeah, yeah. And this is the, the tip of the iceberg. I mean, we, we have a lot, a lot of work as a framework team that we're going to do to uh, make this better. So right now you saw the, the image size of my app um, when, I, when I showed Docker images was about 200 megs. Um, one of the things that we as a framework team are going to do is uh, find a way mm -hmm. to shrink that down. Uh, we, we think we can get ourselves in the 50, 60 meg range um, over the next, you know, half year to a year time frame, um, which will make these publish operations faster. Uh, it'll make your ability to scale and scale these things up and down faster. Um, so this is just the, the tip of the iceberg, but mm. that's done. So now my app has, has been uh, built, published up to app service. If I went to the portal, uh, you would see all that stuff in the portal. So I think it's a pretty cool experience. Yeah, it is. It's pretty amazing. Um, the, the just the number of things, different things that had to happen yeah. here is amazing. Um, 
I mean, that's, that's, our, that's our job. I mean, our job here you know, at, at, uh, at Microsoft is to basically take hard problems yes. and, and make them easy for developers to actually, uh, yeah. you know. A little more approachable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so this, yeah. is just, this, is, this is one of those steps. Um, so those are, those are kind of my favorite .NET, .NET features that we, we put into this version of Visual Studio. Um, there, there is, I was reading some of the comments uh, on the new release last night uh, on one of the blogs that we had. And one of the comments, uh, if, you, if you watched the launch of it yesterday, Scott Hanselman talked about a, a cool feature that I can't show yet um, because we're waiting for the next version of Windows to, to, to come out. Uh, but one of, the, one of the feedbacks was, hey, what are you doing in the WinForm WPF world? Mm. Um, and there is some pretty cool stuff we're doing in, in, in that world as well. So uh, when Windows RS2 comes out, um, I think pretty soon, um, the, the previews are already uh, out there. Yeah. Out there. Uh, we've taken WinForms and we've added high DPI support for WinForms. Uh, so one of the biggest feedbacks we get from customers is, hey, um, I'm running, running my WinForms application on a high DPI monitor, a 4K monitor, and the fonts look really mm -hmm. small, and, and some of the, some stuff overlaps, and doesn't yeah. it doesn't lay out correctly because WinForms was designed in a world when when we actually just it was pixel for pixel for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't do kinds of kinds of layout stuff. So we we have we have done a lot of work over the last uh, six to eight months, adding high DPI support for WinForms, um, and that'll be coming uh, with that, that the new version of Windows. And all you'll have to do is drop a, a manifest file. Into your pro in, into your existing application, you don't, you don't have to recompile. You don't have yeah. to recompile. You can take an existing WinForm app. Mm. If it's called test.exe, you can create a test.exe.manifest, and inside that manifest, you you can there's two switches you can turn on to turn the high DPI support on. Mm. Um, so the next update of Visual Studio will actually have support when you file new a, a WinForm application. It will actually put that file there for you and turn this on by default, um, <coughs> and we'll have the ability in VS to actually add it. Uh, as a gesture as well. Um, so if you're a WinForm customer, uh, that's coming down the, down the pipe for you. Uh, and that high DPI support even supports crazier things as well. If you drag from one monitor to another, uh, yeah. we'll do the magic of, of actually readjusting the app mm -hmm. um, if the monitors are different resolutions. Uh, we added that for WPF um, mm. yeah. early last year, um, and that's coming for WinForms as well. So there's, uh, if you're a WinForm WPF customer, I think the things that are interesting for you is we gave you live unit testing, we have much better editor support for .NET projects. Uh, we've got the high DPI support coming for you as well. Um, so, um, and, and there's a bunch of other crazy stuff we have in the pipeline that we want to do as well. We, we mentioned uh, um, last year at Build, I talked about Centennial, which was the ability to take a WinForm mm -hmm. WPF application and put it into the Windows Store. Now, most of my customers don't want to actually go put a, a WinForm app in the public store, um, but there's something called we call the Enterprise Store. So each, each organization can have their own enterprise store um, and you'll be able to, to take your WinForm WPF apps and publish it to that store, uh, there's a huge benefit for you there. Mm. The biggest challenge with WinForm WPF customers today or desktop customers all up is how do you install desktop applications on all the machines in your office? Um, most companies will you know, write an installer yeah. um, and they'll use some tool to push that to all the, all the desktops. Um, one of the benefits of the Windows Store is if your if your employees actually install the application via the Windows Store for enterprise, mm. then as a developer, I push a new version to the Windows Store, mm. and by the end of the day, everybody's on the newest version. Um, so you'll see us um, add better. To, 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 this this feature is available today. If you if you search for Centennial and, and Scott Hanselman, mm. that'll take you to a blog post that Scott wrote that shows you how to do this. Um, I want to make that something you just click in the tool and say, you know, add Centennial support. And we do all the work for you to make that happen. So, so we do have a bunch of cool stuff coming for those customers. But I think they're, you know, the, those customers are going to get .NET standard, live unit testing, mm -hmm. better editor. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of there is a lot of value, um, you know, outside of the stuff I was describing. Yeah. So, is there anything else that's coming for .NET framework that you want to talk about? Not <coughs> there is more Not stuff yet. coming. There's more stuff coming, but uh, <laughs> let's remain mysterious about that. <laughs> I don't have to put you on the spot. Uh, well, I have, to, I have, to, say, I have to save stuff for the build conference, I think. Yes, so. exactly. Uh, um, so that is happening in uh, May. Second week of May. Yes. Um, that's in Seattle. It's in Seattle. Um, and uh, we have a bunch of exciting .NET stuff that we'll, we'll announce yeah. there and show there. So yeah, it should be a good conference. should be a good conference. Yeah. Um, All right. Anything else you want to talk about? 
Uh, big thing is just go download Visual Studio 2017, yes. try it out. The links um, are here. Just, if you want to download it, just go to visualstudio.com. Yeah. That's a great place. All the download links are right there. Uh, to download it, try it. Uh, please try the, doc, the new .NET Core support. Let us know how it works. Um, we do, if you have any problems migrating a, uh, an older .NET Core project to the new CS Proj, yeah. uh, we have a hotline available. Mm. If you go to the dot.net website, or you go to the ASP.net website, mm. um, both of those websites have links to the um, hotline if you, if you, if you. Yeah, because the, t the tool is really intended for the, the, the simple stuff. It, it, there are going to be cases where you, you're you, going to have you, to do a fair amount of. Yeah, of if you, if you hand edited your, your project JSON, you could actually mm -hmm. hand edit it to a point where our yeah. migration tool can't automatically migrate the tool. Mm -hmm. Uh, might get the project for you. In, in that case, yeah. we, we'd ask you to go and just uh, ping our hotline and we will help you migrate. Um, but I think that's the, that's the big stuff. All right. Very cool. Well, thank you, Scott. Thanks for having me on and, and uh, download the tools, guys. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you again. Actually, tomorrow we have two shows this week. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool.